Good morning. I'm John Kao, and I'm your designated uh, 10 a.m. speaker. I wanted to uh, start with a story uh, which had to do with a visit uh, recently that I made to Australia. I was doing some advisory work for the uh, government of Victoria, and you know it's a long flight, and there are these little white cards that say occupation, which have always been a challenge for me because although I answer truthfully, I tend to answer differently every time. You know, entrepreneur, ex-CEO, former Harvard Business School professor, author, film producer, uh, Broadway producer, once upon a time, et cetera. And this time, uh, I think I might have had a drink on the plane. I decided to fill out the form uh, with the words innovation activist. And there was this really stern looking immigration officer who took one look at me and then looked at my card and looked at me and looked at my card and finally said, is this some kind of subversive activity? Uh, and this is when, of course, I uh, was tempted to say yes, but realized that I'd probably have a very short visit in Australia. So instead, I kind of gave my legitimate cover story, and he let me through. Uh, but the reason I mention this story is because that's probably the label that I like the best when applied to 30 years of engagement with the topic of, of uh, innovation. And now, one of my obsessions is really to try to bring innovation to education, and also to think through uh, how to educate for uh, innovation. Um, so I wanted, in the very brief time we have together, to try to get through three questions. As you read in the blurb, you know, I assert that this is the age of innovation, but I, I would actually more accurately say that this is the age of the need for innovation, and I'll talk some about that. I'll then talk about what is it that we need to do as educators, as stakeholders in the education enterprise to prepare people for the current era, for the world as it really exists, for this age of innovation. And finally, I'll do a deep dive on one capacity that I think uh, helps to illuminate why we're just five minutes into the movie of how to create these new capacities and to make them teachable and learnable within an education context, whatever that might mean going forward, because obviously the context is shifting you know, under our feet uh, as we speak through a variety of uh, disruptive technologies and disruptive uh, business models. So many of you are familiar with this uh, famous uh, Japanese woodblock print uh, from the great artist Hokusai. This was done in 1833, the great wave. And you know the, the key thing about this um, uh, this image is you see the boat uh, with humans way off to the lower right cowering in the face of this massive disruptive wave which even pushes Mount Fuji, the cultural heart of Japan, off to the side. You know, normally the image is monolithic and central and you feel grounded and anchored, but in this world everything seems unmoored. Well, you know, everything old is new again. And so fast forward to uh, this notion of VUCA. How many of you have heard this uh, acronym before? So not too many of you. A little bit of intellectual history. This was actually developed uh, at the US uh, Army War College in the 1980s in response to the need for new models of leadership. Um, and it became an acronym in the 90s. So it's quite fashionable in, um, let's say, investment banking and venture capital circles now to say, oh, this is the era of VUCA, meaning disruption syn synonymously with. But it stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Right? And this is sort of the operating environment that uh, I think whether we are, wh whatever variety of leader we might be, uh, the 3 a.m kind of um, experience that we might have of uncertainty, the, the, the you know, kind of sleepless nights, relate to this whole notion that the sands are shifting under our feet. And if this is the case, what is the role of education in all of this? You know, if education is the big answer, you know, what's the question that we're trying to address? What should education do in this age of the need for innovation? What are the capacities that we need to uh, offer uh, the, uh, the consumers of the education experience, if I can use that, uh, that, that phrase. So the whole notion of what we need to do, I think, is still very much in beta. I mean, I think we're five minutes into that movie, but my own experience has been writing the, you know, the, the, the Ponderosa to try to find interesting examples of 
teaching techniques, facilitation methods, intellectual frameworks that are relevant in this current era of uh, disruption. We're going backwards here. So um, this is not a plug for edge makers, but merely a report that over the last three years, what I've been doing, among other things, is crafting a curriculum for primarily secondary and post-secondary uh, students around the theme of, edge, uh, of innovation. And first of all, it's important to have penny language. So we talk about plant, grow, harvest. You generate ideas, you uh, develop them, and then you uh, realize value from them. And that leads to specific disciplines that have to do with creativity, i.e. ideation, generating new uh, content. Uh, growing is creating narratives around ideas, so using design thinking techniques to amplify the process of refining the ideas, collaborative skills to harness the power of social fluency and social interaction, and then harvest, which is you know, basically taking the idea to some harvest, whether financial or social, is entrepreneurship. And just the whole idea of integrating these disciplines into a cohesive whole has, I think, uh, made a big impact on our ability to put forth an education experience that at least starts to get at this notion of what do each one of us have in terms of resources to develop our capacities in an age of disruption? If this is the age of the need for innovation, what are we supposed to know? And, and how are we supposed to acquire those, uh, those skills? Recently, though, I've kind of gone meta on that framework. I mean, I, that framework is kind of a meat and potatoes framework. It's a, it's a convenient and, I think, useful way of organizing a bunch of disciplines into a cohesive whole. But I've been thinking a lot more about how we address this incredible kind of disruption and uncertainty that we, we face today, where you know, 150 Americans are dying every day of opiate uh, overdoses. We have you know, massive inability to, we have a missing middle you know, in terms of any kind of social consensus. Alienation seems to be a growing uh, factor in our social compact or lack thereof. And so in going meta and trying to think about what would be perhaps an, a, a higher level of capacities that could be teachable and learnable and useful, uh, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about the notion of improvisation. And that's what I want to speak about as point number three, you know, the, the whole idea that, of going deep on one specific capacity. So to help me with that, as advertised, we have what is called an avant-grand uh, piano. So one of the things that I do from time to time is um, serve as uh, Yamaha's first and probably only in history, uh, for <laughs> obvious reasons, um, a, uh, their artist in innovation. That's what they call me, the Yamaha artist in innovation. Because I use music to il illustrate the principles of innovation and to kind of lay out the breadcrumbs of how to make it teachable uh, and learnable. Um, the Avant Grand is a very interesting artifact in and of itself in terms of innovation because for some obscure reason, senior management at Yamaha came down to the engineers and said, we want something that feels and sounds like a concert grand piano, like the nine foot 10 inch behemoths, but we want to make it one fifth the cost, one fifth the weight, and one fifth the price. And the result was the Avant Grand. So, you know, if you are curious about it, you can take a look at this after uh, the, um, uh, the presentation. So, this whole notion of improvisation, I think, is a very rich vein to mine. How many of you play music or uh, perform music? So, quite a few of you. So, I have to explain to the others what you guys know, which is this is sheet music, right? And the little black things on there are notes. And a composer was very creative and put those notes onto a piece of uh, manuscript paper and was very pre prescriptive about what to play. If this were a piece by Chopin or Mozart, it would get down to the details of where the piano player is supposed to put their foot on the pedal, how loud they're supposed to play, the, the expression markings, and so, et cetera, et cetera. This happens to be, in technical terms, what's called a lead sheet, which is the dehydrated music for a very famous tune, uh, All the Things You Are, by Jerome Kern and Oscar Hammerstein. Uh, judging from the demographics in the room, some of you even know this tune. Uh, it's, a, it's a really nice one. 
Uh, and so one way of doing music is somebody gives you sheet music and you play it. And you, know, you play it correctly or incorrectly. And the other way of playing music is improvisation, is jazz. Now, this relates to the whole notion of learning about creativity and, um, and improvisation, which for many people is kind of an alien uh, notion or an uncomfortable one, because they think that it's about giving people permission to do whatever they want. Well, in musical terms, if you play whatever you feel like playing, very creative, but not particularly useful unless you are fond of really weird music. Uh, so if we go back to the sheet music here, we have another option, which is we can, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll play this as if I were looking at a piece of sheet music, this particular song. Pretty boring, right? Dry. That's what the sheet music, unfortunately, allows me to do. Some of you might have liked it. I'll do it again with different expression or different phrasing to, to, to see if it sounds better. So you get the point. My job as the performer of sheet music is basically to play the notes correctly or incorrectly. Right? See, if, see if we can start to tune in on this as a metaphor for how a different approaches to education work. Now, let's take the same tune and approach it the way a jazz musician might approach it. That's cheating it up a little bit, adding some harmonies, et cetera, et cetera. But the real, you know, the acid test, you might say, of a jazz musician is to take the, the melody and play a new melody in the moment that sounds good, which is sort of a great proxy for the innovation process. You know, new ideas developed have to pass a value test. I'm hoping that nobody's going to run out of the room with their hands over their ears. Um, it hasn't happened yet, but um, here we go. So. Improvisation, right? So um, there are a lot of things to say about what just happened up here. For one thing, um, uh, I didn't rehearse this. I couldn't play it again that way for all the amount of money in the world. Um, the music sounds better when you're actually not thinking, uh, but simply focused on the music, what the Zen Buddhists call beginner's mind. Um, there's a negotiation of a whole host of creative tensions, you know, the, the tune versus the improvisation on top of the tune, which if it's too atonal or dis dissonant starts to maybe not sound so pleasing, but if it sticks to the core of the tune, uh, it begins to sound like elevator music. So there's a constant negotiation. And then if, if I had other musicians up on, on stage, you would begin to see that this whole VUCA notion of volatility and not knowing exactly what to expect, you know, dispersion of possibilities, so what notes are going to come next, and uh, uncertainty, like what is that person going to play versus what I'm going to play, or complexity, because now they're playing in a different tonality from me, even though we're playing the same tune, or ambiguity, which is, in the case of more modern jazz, who's going to play first, who's going to play second, are all real phenomena that are exhibited on stage. And jazz is a teachable, learnable discipline. This is not something where people uh, 
make it up, uh, you know, as we said, just randomly, there are actually rules of harmony. So there's a, also a creative tension between, let's say, the, um, uh, the rules of harmony on the one hand, which govern the creation of these uh, timeless, um, you know, American uh, songbook standards, versus the need to constantly go somewhere uh, new. So there's a tremendous amount to be, I think, gained from understanding how uh, innovation um, uh, works through this proxy of, of musical improvisation. And you might be sitting there thinking, well, you know, um, fine, you know, that's fine for Miles Davis, but, you know, what about me? And of course, you know, my interest is not in creating esoteric experiences that are inaccessible to others, but to actually use this as an inspiration to bring it down to the way people learn and the, the way people uh, uh, operate. So what I'm going to do at the risk of being very countercultural to ASU GSB, this being my first time here, is uh, I'm going to suggest that we do a little exercise. Because uh, I'm going to try to persuade you that you're all, in fact, really good improvisers. Somebody's already running out of the room. So uh, <laughs> uh, this is one response to the, the, the creative invitation, right, is to uh, practice avoidance. And um, I'm, 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 of course, I'm not trying to attribute deep motivations to that person. But um, uh, good for illustration purposes. So pick a partner, uh, somebody you know or don't know sitting next to you. And in just a second, I'm going to uh, kick off a little story. And uh, when I say go, one of you, and you can designate who starts, will continue the story. And then when I say switch, the second person will continue the story. And when I say switch again, you'll alternate until I say stop. Okay, pretty, pretty simple. You guys are really smart. So I think that's all the instruction. But the thing I want you to notice when you are engaged with the exercise is how does it feel to you? Um, how do you engage? Um, what's the progression of how you feel about it? What's your level of discomfort? What are you discovering? What's contributing to uh, a good conversation? So, you know, just notice what's going on, okay? So the story begins, um, we were all sitting in the Grand Hyatt Manchester, you know, Olympian Conference Center, when all of a sudden there was a massive crashing sound outside the room and a brilliant flash of light illuminated everything. Go. Switch. 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 And switch.
and stop. Boy, I wish we had another half an hour to debrief that. Uh, <laughs> but you're all great improvisers. Conversation, by definition, is improvisation. When you're standing out there bumping into somebody and chatting them up by the tea station, you know, you don't know what words are going to come out of your mouth 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds in the future. You don't know what your partner is going to say. Um, you know in your gut what a good conversation is, what a bad conversation is. You read the nonverbal cues. Um, if you're fortunate, like I think most of you were, it starts to develop a little bit of uh, uh, momentum. And uh, there was a lot of laughter, uh, which is always a good thing. I mean, there's an emotional content to this uh, notion of collaboration, which makes it uh, you know, an entrainment if we want to get technical about it. And also, uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, issues around overcoming uh, internal resistance, taking risks. Um, uh, taking the plunge, you know, in improv theater, uh, the watchword is uh, take the hit, accept the invitation. You know, somebody says you're a turkey now, uh, covered with uh, whale blubber. Okay, let's go. You know, and you're up on stage doing it. It's the same thing in music, but in some respects, it's also the same thing in life. You know, life presents you with challenges and opportunities, and then you have to respond, right? And so our lives. Our careers are improvisations. You know, Catherine Bateson wrote this great book called Composing a Life, which really should have been improvising a life, but you know, you get the idea. Any entrepreneur knows that the, there's no such thing as the entrepreneurial in-basket. It's, it's what uh, a friend of mine calls the entrepreneurial scramble. Uh, improvisation is a theme throughout our lives. It's a theme of what makes thriving in a VUCA world possible. Uh, even uh, desirable, in a sense. And, you know, brain science kind of confirms this. We have uh, a really interesting guy in San Francisco, Charles Lim, the a kind of wanted to be a jazz saxophone player. His Korean-American parents said, you're going to medical school. But he became one of the world's authorities, not only on hearing, otolaryngology, but on the brain mechanics of jazz. And again, just take it on faith that the top is an fMRI tracing of a classical music pianist in an fMRI machine playing sheet music that was written by another composer. And you see a, a preponderance of blue up in the front, which are the kind of judgmental inhibitory frontal cortex uh, tissues, which are saying, you're playing it right, you're playing it wrong, you know, play it right, et cetera. At the bottom is a jazz musician, and different parts of the brain are lighting up that correspond to uh, a, a, a composition in the sense of uh, uh, literary composition that correspond to flow of ideas with the inhibitory side um, somewhat uh, 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 removed or, or attenuated. So this is really exciting because, you know, really what I'm here to say to you is that there's a whole bunch. I mean, you know, improvisation is one of 10 cardinal capacities that I feel are really important in the, um, in the age of innovation that we're in and that are not represented in the education enterprise as it currently exists. And the brain science is really interesting because it shows that innovation is a capacity. It's not a wish. I mean, you know, I spent a few years learning how to play the piano and learning how to play jazz. And arguably, unless one of you, you know, your ringers, if I invited somebody to come up on stage and gave them all the encouragement of, you know, applause and, you know, equivalent of soccer trophies and picture on the wall and everything, unless they had been practicing in secret, they would not be able to do this. So improvisation, innovation requires practice. It requires exposure, right? You're on a path to mastery. It takes time which is very uh, pregnant with meaning in terms of the learning process. It's about your attitude towards risk. There are now MRI studies that show that in response to challenging and novel stimuli, some people kind of become conservative and centripetal, and other people lean forward and try to be proactive and make something happen. And the brain science shows this is even correlated with consumer behavior and political attitudes, right? Wow. You know, so there's a lot to be learned there. The whole notion of creative tensions as being neither, uh, um, uh, you know, getting us out of these Cartesian binds uh, in terms of how we're supposed to do things, also very, very interesting. So this is about giving you a bit of a core sample. You're all great improvisers. You, are, you all have the capacities for innovation that I talk about. The question is how you cultivate them and then how you cultivate them 
uh, in others. And so uh, to, well, I guess that's it then. So, uh, so that's it. So john at johnko.com, edgemakers.com. I wrote a book called Jamming, which is about uh, what leaders can learn from jazz musicians that you know, after a long time is still in print, so I'm very happy with that. Thank you very much for being here, and I hope this was of some value to you. Thank you.